Oh God, it is just a blessing that you know our names. While, while we may stumble around, while we may uh, try to figure out who people are, we know that that's not a thing with you. You know us. You desire us to be in relationship with you, and you, you desire us to, to take those things that have broken us and lay them aside so that we can fully say that we live as a child of the King. So, Lord, we ask that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart here be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. So, we are in the middle of a season called Eastertide. And, and what the season of Eastertide is, it's, it's that period from resurrection that we celebrated two Sundays ago that goes all the way to, to Pentecost Sunday. And sometimes we don't know exactly what it is that we need to do with Eastertide season. You know, we, we know that we keep the uh, pyramids in the church white. And we know that we just celebrated Easter, but we have a, a tendency to go, so, so what do we do with this season? And, and this year I thought we would continue kind of in our theme that, that we've had throughout the week about, awaken, about the year about awakening. How, how is it that we can continue to awaken inside of each and every one of us to fully live in the identity that matters most? The identity that we are children of God. And, and looking at the uh, lectionary, which is a, a set of readings that, that's broken up over a three-year period where you can read about 70% of the Bible if you were to follow the lectionary day after day after day. Looking at the lectionary, uh, it, it, it's landed on the letters, uh, letter of First John. And I'm like, you know, that's going to be interesting. We, we really haven't. I know I've preached on First John 4, 7, and 8 because that's my confirmation verse that I've shared with you and I shared with all the confirmands that, that we've had. But we really haven't taken a, a look at First John. And, and there are actually... There's actually one chapter that we're really going to hammer down on over the next two weeks and then look at another one uh, af uh, a little bit later. But, but this, pad, this, this book, number one, it, it's confusing. I, I love doing Bible study, and I tell people to look up First John, and all of a sudden I hear them reading stuff from the Gospel of John because we, we don't know it's there. It, it, it's one of those books that we're like, oh, yeah, that, that's one of those smaller books in the back of the Bible. There's only five chapters in this particular book. But when we take a look at these five chapters, we see a letter that was written to a community that was having issues. They had false prophets that were, were coming in and they were denying the divinity of Jesus Christ. They were uh, a lot of people that were uh, not dealing with the idea of, of unity, especially the unity that we have as believers through the love and grace of Jesus Christ. And First John 1, 3 tackles this right away when, this, when uh, the writer says, What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Sometimes the church, we get so wrapped up in the idea of the fellowship with each other, which is a, a very, very good thing. But the one thing that we forget, that fellowship with each other is only made possible with the fellowship we have with the Father and the Son and with the Holy Spirit. When we have all of that fellowship together, then we as a church can be activated to go out into the world. And it helps defeat the ideas that, that Jesus was just this guy walking around the earth saying good things. But he was the son. And he was and is the son of God. The one who came so that we may have life and life abundantly. So we'll continue moving to John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And I invite you to follow along in your Bibles, or we'll have the words 
put it on the screen so you can follow along as we hear our scripture for this morning. John writes, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The very beginning of this passage, there, there is a three-letter word there, and that word is see. Some Bible translations uh, translate that word as, as look. Look at what great love the Father has lavished upon us. But, but looking at the, the Greek word that's behind that, I think the word see or look is a very poor word to be, to be used here to, to talk about what John is telling his readers. See, when I think about the word look, I, I have a tendency to look of it as, as a passive thing. You know, when we see or look, it's just something that we kind of, we glance or, or, or we catch a, a part of. You know, sometimes when I'm watching TV or watching Netflix, I'll, I'll realize that I'm on my phone a whole lot more than I'm, I'm watching what we have on the screen, but I'm still seeing because I can tell you bits and pieces of what's happening, but, but for the full story, and matter of fact, Trace and I, we've done this at times, we, we realized, wait a minute, we, we, we didn't see what was going on because we were just looking. We were just observing at a side of what it is, and we have to rewind several minutes of what was going on so that we could fully understand what is happening. It reminded me of uh, May 6th, 2020. Uh, last year, you may remember the uh, Blue Angels and the uh, Thunderbirds. They, they decided to do a flyover all of the, the hospitals in, in the Metroplex area. And you know, they all started all the way in McKinney, went all the way out toward, towards Fort Worth, just flying by every single hospital so that the, the health care workers that were there knew that they were being appreciated and, and we were cheering them on. Now, I knew that I, there was no way in the world I was going to get to, I think the closest one was uh, the Richard, uh, Richardson uh, Methodist Hospital. That was the closest one. There was no way in the world I was going to drive out there so I could see them fly over uh, just for a second. So I turned on my TV and was watching the whole flyover as it was uh, hitting each hospital. But, you know, I realized that, that I, I was still missing it. You know, even though I had the opportunity to see this, this flyover happen, and I got to see the entire flyover from, from McKinney all the way out to Fort Worth, I, I, I didn't really get to see the whole thing. I, I didn't get to feel the experience. I didn't get to, to have that emotion that that has whenever you see something this majestic and this this awe inspiring happen. There's a word that I think uh, that is used in some translations. As a matter of fact, uh, during the prayer time, I looked down at our our altar Bible. And it uses that word, and that's a King James Version. A and the word that it uses instead of see or look is behold. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I hear the word behold, I see something a lot more gripping than just see or to look. So w when you have the opportunity to behold something, it means that you are digging in 
deep. You are allowing the opportunity for, for, for what is written there and for the love of God to, to really be layered upon you, if you will, that to allow the, the love of God to be something that, that grips you, that, that, that holds you. It's not something that you just glance at and go, okay, well, that was good. I'm going to move on to something else. No, it, it, it's fully understanding that the love of God is, is something that God just continues to pour out over us day after day after day, even when we deserve it and, and even when we don't. That God's love is continued to, to be poured out on us so that, I love those two words, so that we understand fully our relationship with our Creator. I get so tired hearing about the, the angry God or the, or the God that just can't wait to, uh, to settle a score because that's not the God we worship as Christians. We, we, we have a God who, who desires us to be holy and, and wants us to, to walk in his ways, but he does this by pouring out his love on us. And then there's something specifically in this passage that, that he is wanting us to behold through his great love. And we see it twice, but in the first three verses, he wants us to know that we are children of God. Verse 1 reminds us what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And then verse 3 says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. That means for us that, that there is a whole lot more for us to, to experience and to see. And if we just take the opportunity just to see or to look, we are going to miss it. We're going to miss it and not fully behold to see what God has for us. I, I love hearing in Scripture the, the phrase that we are children of God. It, it gives to me two separate but, but connected pictures with each other. The first reminds us of, of the covenantal relationship that we, each and every one of us, have with God. And this covenant is, is something that, that lives out all the way back to the beginning of Scripture. This promise that God will always be there for us. We see that covenant lived out in the story of Adam the story of Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David. Each of those covenants are, are ways that, that we are pieced together knowing that, that even when we fail, God will always be there to pick us up. Now, sometimes we may have a hard time seeing that in the Old Testament scriptures with all of the, the stuff that is going on, but the thing that we must remember that it is, it, it, it's us, our sinful nature, that continues to, to make us divided against God. And God continues to try to find ways to, to bring us back in relationship with him. And that's what gives us the new covenant. The new covenant that we celebrate through the life, death, suffering and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It reminds us that, that we are not just in a covenantal relationship, that, that we have these things that, that, that we follow, but that we are now adopted through the new covenant in Jesus Christ. Galatians 4, verses 6 and 7 says it this way. Because you are children... God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Isn't that a beautiful reminder? That, that we no longer have, have this, this covenant that, that, that knits and picks at us, but, but we are adopted into the family of God, and that adoption isn't just for those of us that are sitting in these pews or are watching online this morning. 
it is something that is passed on to those all over the world. That, that we can receive that adoption. One of my favorite stories in Acts is a story of Paul as he goes to uh, the Oropagus, or sometimes called Mars Hill. And uh, during this story, Paul is uh, preaching all about Jesus Christ, and, and it really piques the imagination of, of those leaders that, that are there at this, this mound of, of thinking where all of these philosophies are laid out. And, and, and Paul goes to this place to have a conversation with them, these, these heathens, if you will, the, these pagans, these people who are nowhere near the, the Jewish standard of the day. And, and they ask him, what is it that you are, are preaching about? What is it that you are talking about? And Paul, he looks around and he uses their aspects so that they can see exactly what it is that he is trying to talk about. And he noticed that there's this statue and that's kind of maybe off in the corner. And so, you know, you have the statue here that, that's all about this unknown God. Well, let me tell you who this unknown God is. He was basically saying, you know, you see God's love being poured out on you, but you have no idea who it is because you don't know what you're looking for. And then later he goes and he quotes their own poets. He, he quotes their own poets and say, you even write about who this God is, about how much he loves you and, and how much he cares for you. And then Acts 17, he quotes this passage. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. It is a reminder that, that it is in God that, that we live and move and have our being because we are God's children. And even if you're not a part of the Jewish line, you are children of God. You were created in God's image and now are image bearers and, and God calls us back to remember his love for us. Now the second part of this passage is a little bit uh, difficult because it, it has that three letter word that we rarely like to talk about in church and that word is sin. We don't like to talk about sin very much. I was doing a devotion, and, and a good friend of mine that I do this devotion with, he was telling me that uh, the guy who, who is a, a Methodist pastor who writes this devotion, he was like, well, well, he's really sounding like a Baptist right now. You Methodists, you don't talk about this like, like he is. I said, you know what? That's a shame. Not that, not that we want to live in, in, in guilt or fear or, or full trepidation, but if we don't understand that we are sinful people, then how can we fully embrace and accept the love that Christ has poured out for each and every one of us? First John it says, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Sin is that, is that separation that, that keeps us apart from the love and grace that, that God has for each and every one of us. That sin is not something that, that God places on us, but sin is something that we use to separate us from the love that God has for us. And the, and the sad thing about sin is that there are a lot of times that we fail to realize that we are living in that sin. Because what has happened, we don't, we don't think about God being our father or, or God being this one who lavishes his love upon us. We think about what's in it for me. How can I use what I have so I can get more and more of what it is that I want? And when we look at how we take a look at sin in that way, it's because if we go back to that very first word that we talked about, we are just seeing. We're, we're, we're just looking. We're, we're just taking the opportunity just to glance at the love 
that God has for us, and we fail to fully behold the love that God lavishes upon each and every one of us. When we behold the love of God, we see ourselves not as miserable, horrible sinners, but we see ourselves as saints. We see ourselves as saints because of who God is, not anything about who we are or, or, or what we have done, but it's all because of what God has done for us. So how do, how do we move beyond this? How, how do we move past this or to allow this beholding to, to define who we are, beholding in the great and powerful love of our God? I think we do that by becoming, allowing beholding to become becoming, to say that when everything is said and done, what I want people to say about me is that I have the appearance of Christ in my life. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. And we are called as children of God to become like him. You may have heard me use this phrase over and over again about Christ-likeness. How, how can I have my life really look like Jesus Christ? Not, not, to say that, not that I'm becoming Jesus Christ. There's no way in the world that I could ever become who Christ is. But when people see me, I want them to see Jesus Christ in their life. And there's ways that we do that. First of all, we become like him when we serve. One of the beautiful images that, that happens in the Gospel of John is when Jesus has all of his disciples gathered together for, for, for this last meal. And, and Jesus takes off his clothes and, and he, he puts a towel around his waist and he goes to each of his disciples and he washes their feet. Hey, back in 2004, we had a, a brand new bishop that was, uh, that was given to the uh, North Texas Conference by the name of Bishop Moncur. And, and this recently came up in a, a Facebook post. And one of the things that Bishop Moncur did, when, when you think of a bishop, you think of some, oh, high, mighty power bishop that you have to bow down to and, and, and do everything that he says. But Bishop Moncur, he, he did something different during that ordination service. That, that when it came time to ordain the pastors of that class, he, he took off his robe and, and he put a towel around his waist and he went and he washed every single ordinance feet. Just as a reminder to them and, and a reminder to me as, as a future ordinance that we're not here to lord anything over anybody else. But as your pastor and as the pastor in Royce City, Texas, I am called here to serve because that is who Christ has called me to be. We become like him in suffering. I don't know how you can suffer more than Jesus did. Going in front of Pilate, going in front of the Jewish leaders, being whipped, beaten, spat upon, ridiculed, and then led out to a hill to die on a cross. But we are too called to suffer. We are too called to realize that, again, this isn't about us at all. And when we make our Christian faith about us, about what we want, and, and, and how we want people to bow down to us, we fail to see what it is that Christ has called us to do. And sometimes that is just to lay down our lives in service to the king. And then finally, we become like him in mission. Jesus was sent on the most amazing mission of the world, and that's to, to leave his place by the Father's side to come down to be born as a baby, and then to teach, and then to, to die, and to be raised again. That, that was Christ's mission, and we are 
to become like him in our own mission in the world. John 17, 18 says, as Jesus says to the Father, as you have sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. So to fully behold the great love that the Father has lavished on us, we must realize that we are called to be in service. We are called to suffer with those who are suffering. We are called to be in mission, to share the love of God with others, that not keep this, this great gift to ourselves, but, but to leave this place, to leave the comfort of our, our, our living rooms or, or wherever we may be and share the love of God with others. Will, will we be rejected? Yeah, we will be rejected, and that's okay. We will just share God's love even more so that when people look at us, they don't see an angry mob trying to get their own way, but they see the love and grace of Jesus Christ in a powerful way. So just as Paul was telling those at the Oropagus, we can tell others, you are God's children. And God's love is lavishly poured out upon you so that you may receive his love and power in your life. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for the great love that you have given each and every one of us. And Lord, sometimes I think it's hard for us to see that. And I think it's hard to see that because that's what we're doing. We're just trying to see. We're trying to, to comprehend something that is so powerful around us that we miss it. So Lord, we ask that you give us the opportunity to, to set aside those things that may distract us to set aside those things that, that call us and beckon us away from who you are. We ask that you help us to set aside the sin and, and, and to leave it aside so that no longer digs in us, <coughs> no longer has the power <coughs> no longer has power over us so that we can fully live in your love and your grace. And we pray this in the name of the one who loves us and cares for us, Jesus our Lord. Amen.